Welcome, 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 everybody. It's lovely to see you all. Friday, we're beginning to become more distinct, aren't they, the days of the week? About three months ago, you just forgot what day it was all week. And it's, uh, wow, they all melded into one. I'm beginning to notice weekends again, which is pretty cool. We've had a couple of conversations recently about Egyptian art. Oh, and yeah. Sid has a burning question. So Emma is going to come on. Emma studied art. Hi. <laughs> I studied classical archaeology and ancient history at Oxford about 10 years ago. Who might be the person to ask? I can about... answer that question. Every time you ask it, I'm going mad. I was like, Sid, no. Um... <laughs> I mean, everybody's been really kind and telling me what they think, and, that, and I'm absolutely convinced that, that, that everybody's right. But there is a, you, do you agree with me that there were, at least in wall art, in, in painting, there was um... a... 2000 period year period of really in a, no evolution there is some slight evolution over that period but um you, you're right it doesn't change a lot and when it does change it happens for um political or religious reasons because the, the reason it all looks like that for so long is to do with the worldview that the egyptians had they believed that any image was literally the thing so that's why you have that weird pose where the heads are forward but the shoulders are like that and it's like so that everyone has enough limbs yeah um the the paintings in tombs particularly like they're designed to represent that person physically so if you did them purely in profile they'd only have one arm i mean if you say for example time jumped uh, you've got a little time jump machine in your pocket and you could just boogie down to the 14th century and go and look at french art in a church, sort of primitivist art there, or you could jump to Italy and, and 100 years later and see the astonishing difference and amazing beauty of the early Renaissance. And then you could just go straight to the 19th century. These are, these are only 150 year, 200 yeah, years. Yeah, I mean, they, the other reason it doesn't change beyond just the iconography of it is the other thing that the Egyptian culture was really tied up around is the idea of order. So they deliberately didn't change anything for a very, very long period of time. Um, that's why there are so many rules to the, the art style because they kind of believe that everything within Egypt or other upper and lower kingdom, it's basically the whole strip down the Nile, um, not yeah. just the bit, the sort of square that we think of as Egypt today. My country, Sudan, where I was yes, born exactly, was, exactly. was Egypt. Um, that whole area they considered sort of their, their place and that was a place of order. But people don't quite understand what, I'm, what we're talking about because they didn't hear, the, you know, the last time I asked. I, they, they're now caught up, which is great. But it, is, it does defy cultural logic, doesn't it? But, but to not change for I mean, 2,000 plus years. It I mean, is a very a, long period not to change. Um, yeah. But, but, but there are periods where it does change. It were deliberately taught in academies. They were like specifically for drawing in that particular style. So there are these periods where everything goes very wrong, usually war or something. So in between Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and then Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom, there are these periods called the intermediate periods where the whole structure of their administration fell apart, including the academies for art. So you right. get these really bizarre things where somebody is clearly kind of remembered how they used to do the art, but they can't quite remember how to do it correctly. <laughs> so okay. you get like, you get some very wonky images. Like the, the one that always stands out in my brain is uh, there's one of like a cow that's done sort of all, almost all in profile, but it has two eyes on the side of its head. Yeah. It's really freaky looking um, the because they just forgot the royals. I mean, there's subtle changes between each of the kingdoms and within the different dynasties because of Egyptian history. We tend to talk in dynasties rather than centuries because we don't know for certain when things happened. We know roughly the order that things happened, but we don't right. know exactly the years. There are a couple of kings in the 12th dynasty, which is Middle Kingdom, I think. Um, right. There was a guy called Sesostris III who had a particularly difficult reign. And so he's the only king that you see depicted as anything other than a young man. Because, of course, like, they, because they believed that the, um, an image was the thing. So an image of a person was the person. So if you depict the king as a young man, he's always a young man. But 
because of this difficult career with wars of wars and famines and whatever he's like the only one that's depicted with like wrinkles and his son okay. is as well yeah so you can always tell him it's like oh hello it's the old man um not, <laughs> it doesn't even look old but you know just compared to all the, these like child men that you see everywhere else it's the amana period which was new kingdom 18th dynasty this king named Akhenaten who was mad as a box of frogs, decided he was going to upend the religion. He would start a whole new religion, rearrange the entire system, move to a, a completely new palace. And as part of this overhaul, instituted an entirely new art style. So you have a period of about 20 odd years where the art is completely different. It's still in that sort of semi-profile. The two-dimensional the figures look really different. They've got really elongated heads, very long limbs, this sort of S curve to their back and kind of protruding belly. So you might have seen, say, statues of Nefertiti. That was his one of his wives. Because he was completely upending the religion, the sudden drastic change in art was to kind of underline that and be like, right, that's the end of that new religion, new art style, new everything. Unfortunately for him, that didn't go so well. It turned out people didn't really want to be completely re upended. So yeah. um, like for the first half of this, there's one royal sculptor slash architect who's sort of instituting it all. And his art style is a lot more radical. And then as it goes on, it's like, oh, we're not doing very well and people don't like this. Let's, let's sort of soften the edges. So they've got another guy in called Tutmos who, who was a little bit more like the old style. And then after Akhenaten died, his son took over eventually, Tutankhamun. And the really fun thing with Tutankhamun and slightly later is, although it moves back to almost, almost the same as the old art style, there's still bits of, of fashion and bits of shapes from the Amana yeah, yeah. The stuff from Tutankhamun's tomb, the figures have a bit of an S-curve to their backs and they have different garments to earlier periods. And I always find that really, really weird because they obliterated Didakhanatan from the record. He's he's just referred to as the heretic or the enemy. <laughs> he doesn't get to, he doesn't get a name anymore. But they still kept that bit of the art style. Which is really weird. That's really weird. That's really interesting. That stays for a lot, yeah, up until sort of the Ramesid era, era which is a long period of time. Uh, talk, we could talk for general. hours about this. All of this is so fascinating. I know, it's so fun. <laughs> it, is, it is so fascinating. And I was always fascinated to find out that, you know, the, the, the statues of, say, Phidias, for example, were all done by, I mean, they were also gaudy and colourful, yeah. amazing. Look. Yeah. Course, there was a, a wonderful yeah. exhibition that came to the, the Ashmolean, the Art and Archaeology Museum in, in Oxford, which is one of my favourite places, um, where they built a whole load of um, replicas and painted them based on the paint that survives on those statues. Yeah. And they're beautiful. And like the way really I always think, they are very gaudy. But if you think about it, like in blistering hot Mediterranean sun, white marble would be absolutely impossible to look at. It would just be blinding. Yeah. Yeah. You know, freshly cut white marble would be horrendous. So you've got to have something that stands out from a distance because, okay, in museums, we might be standing, you know, this far apart, but, you know, in a, on a pediment, that's the word I'm looking for, the, yeah. the, the archway thing, that's going to be several feet up. And you have to have something that, that stands out. Oh, one of my other favourite facts about Egyptian art, you can tell whether something's designed to be inside a building or outside a building by how the frieze works. So if the frieze sticks out, that's for inside. And if the frieze uh. is cut into the rock, that's for outside, because then the shadow naturally forms uh, a kind of line around everything. Beautiful contrast, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've rambled for ages, I'll shut up now. <laughs> and uh, putting me putting me straight i'm glad to be able to to finally fill that gap in your knowledge <laughs> thank you i will not ask i don't need to ask anybody that again no <laughs> thanks emma hello robin I, I heard a little hello there hello there you are where are you robin i'm in ottawa good ottawa are you are you knitting something i'm knitting a few things actually i've got where'd they go so i've got a pair of socks Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. Are they for yours or for someone else's? For me. Um, I don't knit gifts anymore. Christmas went badly. <laughs> <laughs> They're cute. I'm 
also working on a scarf that's based on Kara's uniform. Oh, that's lovely. And that looks like mohair. It's all wool from MBA and Targi, which are North American breeds of sheep. Gorgeous. Beautiful. There's Do you find it hard finding wool? Good wool. That no. always has no. like the most incredible products right. and the best colors. Ah, oh, gosh, that's brilliant. I, everyone's going to be chatting about all that because that looks like really good knit work. I'm, I'm not an expert by any stretch, but that still looks really nice. That lovely, loose, comfortable, soft weave you've got going on with the scarf. It's really soft. Yeah, I bet. That's fantastic. So how's Ottawa? It's all right. The heat wave ended last week, so it's actually tolerable to be outside. Yeah. Um, most people are wearing masks where they're supposed to. I'm in a tourist district. So a lot of people seem to think the rules don't apply here. Oh, because they don't live here. So it doesn't matter what they do to you guys. I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most people are still working from home since it's a government town. They're probably fine. Are you fine? You seem fine. Uh, some days are better than others. I'm in a better position than some people. Do you live by yourself with family, with the friends? I'm by myself. Did you get lonely or are you pretty good by yourself? I'm usually pretty good by myself. It has gotten harder, like the yeah. longer it goes on. I did get to meet up with some of my friends towards the end of June when they first opened up the patios. Yeah. Well, that was nice. It was a bad idea. I'm not going back to another patio for a very long time. Yeah. But I went out with my uh, wife the first time to a restaurant in a mall because we're in phase four here in Massachusetts. And they've been doing, doing quite well. And there is a spike uh, because people are allowed to eat inside at restaurants. We couldn't do that. But we, they had a balcony and they had the tables quite far apart. And it was an outdoor mall. I have to tell you, my wife threw out the whole meal, certainly didn't enjoy it. Anyone walked by on the sidewalk, she immediately put her face mask on. I mean, she just freaked out. And, and it's, it really is deep rooted now. I mean, it's, we have a very strong self-preservational streak <laughs> as humans. <laughs> We're not doing that again. Either. I mean, it's just not going to happen. And we'll, we, I mean, we'd like to, but we'll just get takeout. We have to eat out. The other thing is, of course, we now cook a lot more, which is really good. It's a good thing. I felt really bad for the servers. Like, we're all at our tables. You don't have to wear a mask at your table because no. you're eating and eating. So they're reaching into a crowd of unmasked people, getting well within the two meters. Oh. They collect our, like, dirty dishes and everything. And it's just like, no, no, this shouldn't be happening. Yeah. A table on the side where we can bus our own table so we don't have direct contact with the servers but what we did is just put our mask on whenever the server came to the table and uh, whatever happened and we just that we just stopped conversation mask on he did what he had to do he left mask off and as we were and what do you do in your real life i was a student and decided that grad school wasn't for me so i'm i dropped out and now i dropped out of college too and it was Probably the worst time, but definitely the right decision. So yeah. now I just need to figure out what I'm going to do. So you're exactly the same age range as my, my son. What does the future look like? Um, so you're right in that zone. Do, do you find that in the last two or three years, as you've been making these decisions and, 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 and acting, that the landscape has completely changed? Or do you think, no, I still kind of have a grip on what kind of thing um, the, the future look, look, looks like? What do you think from, from, your, from the horse's mouth? It's completely changed, I think. I started doing grad school because, like, I have two BAs, but you can't get a job with a BA anymore. You need to have a master's. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'll get a master's because that's what you're supposed to do. And it was just academically the worst two years of my life. Right. Essentially, yeah. the best two years of my life. The program was, like, a variety of disciplines, like, thrown together. What were you doing? Like, anthropology or something? Russian studies. Maybe. Yeah, because it's never too late. I certainly went to acting school after every, I, I'd failed at everything else. And so I was one of the older, older patients in the acting school. And in between dropping out of college and going to acting school, I spent two and a half years working in a store in London. I'm probably at exactly the same stage as you are before going, right, I'm gonna go to acting school. So maybe you should go into art history, like Emma. Maybe. <laughs> we're thinking about, we're thinking about. If you were prepared to do a thesis on it, then Okay, that's we're probably, that's out of enthusiasm. Sarah Hall, that's not out of who I believe told. I saw had a giant fish pillow earlier. Yeah, oh. it's hi. Hi, Sid. Hi. I'll just go get it if you want. I'll be like, it's just on my bed. Go get it. 
All right, right back. Be right back. We'll just look at your room, your staff. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> okay. It's, it's literally in my bed. It's a whale shark. Oh my goodness. It's I love whale sharks. Nice. They're the coolest fish. They're so cool. They're, they're so big. They're so huge and so kind. Exactly. They're not like actual sharks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Where are you? Uh, you sound like Antipodean. I'm in Australia right now. Ah. It's about, it's like 6.30 here. So I might be like a little, but I just had coffee. It's actually good because it gets me up early. I'm, I'm a medical student, so I have to go to the hospital every day. I oh. have to get up at 7 a.m. Monday to Friday. So this stops oh, me God. sleeping in. Yeah. Okay. Well, glad to be of service. Um, whereabouts, <laughs> <laughs> whereabouts in Australia are you? Uh, Newcastle. Have you heard? No. Do you know where Sydney is? Yes, I've been to Sydney. Yeah, um, about an hour and a half drive north. Oh, so just the other side of, just to, like near the Blue Mountains? Yeah, a bit more on the coast. But um, mm. yeah, you're, that is pretty good because most people understand Sydney and nothing else about Australia. I really can't pretend to understand much about Australia, except I did go to the Blue Mountains and I held a koala bear for a little while. And, oh, nice. Uh, it was one of, the, one of my life memories and it smelled so much of eucalyptus. It was like having a little kind of, essential oil bear right in my they, hand those things like a lot of respect for them but they basically all they do is eat leaf and sleep they don't yeah. do anything else and they're really really grumpy so <laughs> we kind of just be like they're cuddly come hug them i'm not gonna talk to them because they don't do anything the, my favorite <laughs> australian animal is the wombat those things made me laugh Charging around, digging, charging around, digging. They do more than eat and sleep, wombats. Wombats are pretty yeah. fantastic. I grew up in, in a bit sort of rural area in Australia, so we would sometimes see them, like when you go out in the bush. So yeah. you would see little holes, and wombats are like big, like yeah, big, big things. Yeah. So whenever you'd see one, you just kind of leave it to its business. Yeah, and I imagine it's quite fierce. fierce. <laughs> well, it's just, it's just, but have you seen one walk? They're so cute. They just kind of lumber. <laughs> <laughs> like they're doing, like they got so much attitude, and they got places yeah. to be. <laughs> do you have to do a lot of different modules? Do you do like anatomy and I don't know oncology? You know, do you have to do? Do you have to cover all the bases? Yeah. So the first three years for my degree, because it's a five-year course, we do sort of like that. We do something called professional practice, and then medical science, which is they're all basically the same thing. Where usually we pick a topic like neurology or um, hematology for four weeks and we like just try and work through it. Yeah. And now in my two last years, we call clinical years. So I'm technically doing a course called medicine surgery where I do eight weeks of general medicine and eight weeks of surgery. I did just come off doing watch, which is women's adolescent general impression? health. Of which COVID? Kind of happened yeah, the whole beginning, because you just, you were, you were there from the beginning and you were, a, a pair of eyes on the wall at first, but you probably got sucked in. Yeah, um, we got put down on lockdown, like sort of around March, but we were there when it was just starting to brew. To be honest, we didn't really take it seriously because with medical people, which is a big failing with us, and I've kind of inherited it, is we always compare things to the flu. So right. does it kill as much as the flu? Is it as effective as the flu? Is it basically the big nightmare that is the flu? And yeah. so we're going, oh, it's not too bad. And then yeah. the cases started coming up and then we're like, oh, oh, maybe, maybe this isn't so great. And yeah. now when we went into lockdown for like about two months and now we're back, but Australia's having a bit of a second wave right about now. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're having that same feeling of, oh, this is starting to go a bit sideways on us. So you start to hear things and more and more restrictions are starting to come in. We have to wear masks just about all the time in the hospital now. We didn't have to yeah. before. In our course, if you get even a little bit sick, you have to go get a swab. And what that is, is basically you go to a clinic. We are really lucky in Australia. If you yeah. need to go get a swab, you can get it on the day. But basically you go to this clinic, you say you're a healthcare worker, they get this swab, they stick it down your throat, and then they stick it up your nose. Same swab. Whoa. And then you get your results of whether you're COVID positive or negative within 24 to 48 hours. But right. anytime you are sick and you have to stay home. If, so, so many of our specialists, I just don't see them. They're sick. Yeah. They can't come yeah. into the hospital. What makes you happy? How do you escape all this horror? 
honestly, just like a lot of like Star Trek. That's what actually I wasn't into Star Trek until about last year next, or this year. Doc, when Dr. Bashir was doing all that techno babble in that episode and Jake was like, what the hell are you saying? What is this? <laughs> I, I understood that so hard because yes. mad, mad people have a language all to their own and we are terrible at not at explaining ourselves. But <laughs> I don't know, just any sort of media. I like to invent my own stories. I'm really bad at that. So when I watch Star Trek, I think I'm going to write a Star Trek episode in my head and I'm going to write a new alien species or like a new sort of thing in the Star Trek universe. That's been- Oh, like brilliant, my... please do. If you have time. I mean, you're not gonna have much time, but uh, if, when you have time, do it. You've got so, got a really great audience here. People, everyone's sharing information and whatnot all the time and te links to their own, the stories they've been writing. And there's so many talented fan fiction writers here, which is phenomenal. Because yeah. actually they're not just fan fiction writers, they're just writers, period. They just have to be choosing to do fan fiction. Uh, and these people here are so creative. Like I, yeah. if I wasn't into medicine, I would maybe try and go into like directing because that's like my yeah. big little nerd passion. But the people here just blow me away with like their ideas and how creative they are. So I was like, please funnel the creativeness because all I think about now is like antibiotic classes. I need to sort <laughs> of get out of my head. <laughs> you know, you should um, start uh, when this is over. Start a club of, of people who are like-minded. Direct something and use all your people as actors and, and, and you know what I mean? Just get yeah. something, a, a, a silly five minute fun piece that is just you expressing yourselves um, as something else. And you can probably, you know, use something on the campus as, as a set. Get it out of your system. Don't, don't let it sit there going up, you know, I might've been if I hadn't done, but deep that, because that's not allowed. No one in my family's into medicine. So yeah. they're always kind of a bit confused that why I was into medicine, but I think they're also very grateful because I mean, it also is a very stable career choice. It really is. I and mean, it's I the weirdest thing hearing you say, my parents just don't get it. I'm, I want to be a doctor. <laughs> Do you know the TV show MASH? I watched that and adored that as a kid. And I like worship talk I pierce. And that got my entrance up and my parents were like, okay, okay, sure, Sarah, you're 11, sure. And then when I went through high school, I was in a very rural area and doctors don't really come out of where I live. So right. like, keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Good luck. And then, and they're like, I'm going to Newcastle and they're like, okay. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> but they're very supportive. Are you with friends or are you alone? Or? I live with roommates, but I don't really see them very much. So yeah, it is very easy. And also cause we're told not to go out and socialize now because yeah. a bunch of hotspots popped up at pubs. Which right. is very Aussie. So it's kind of like we're being discouraged. Are they, are they think, cool? Did you get on? Oh, one of them gave me a lot of advice on cooking with taro root because I'm trying yeah. to get into cooking. Give it to me, man. Yeah. My dad, my dad's from Manchester. We eat like steam cooked vegetables at home. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, yes, yeah. taro is definitely a thing. Have you got, because it doesn't look like you might have enough, a big kitchen. Or There's a kitchen, sort of a main kitchen outside my room. So that's where they have, hang out. Do you have a, a pressure cooker in there? Uh, no, I have an induction cooker, a little hot plate. A little hot plate, yeah, that's useful, that's really cool. You kind of, yeah. I, the, the ideal thing for a student really is this, this thing that is, is a new, there's a new hybrid machine, which is a, hot, a pressure cooker and an air fryer in the same unit. Oh yeah. So you can roast a chicken in the pressure cooker and then fry it off and get all the skin crispy and brown and do it really quickly because speed is of the essence for, for you, you you got to get things done yesterday. Really happy that you're happy because you do seem happy. And what I, what I think you should do is go ahead and direct something. Just get, yeah. just do, you know, just get a bunch of people together and say, let's just shoot, let's just shoot the breeze. Here. Let's just see if we can do the unlikely thing for a bunch of yeah. medical geeks and do something wildly creative. If anyone else wants to direct, they can direct it too. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but you, so you don't get into that kind of competitive thing and just whip your iPhones out or whatever little thing you have, light it, shoot it. Yeah. I have a music recommendation for you. I don't oh, know if you heard about them in America, but I've been really jamming to them right now. Right. And they're an Aussie band. So uh, I don't know if you heard of them, Tame Impala. They had a few. A I remember Tame Impala. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Their new album is very good. Oh, so great. I've, got, I've been jamming uh, out to that. Early stuff of theirs. So that's a really good idea. Fantastic. Yeah. I'll give you a movie recommendation. It's called Santi and it's on Netflix and it's an Indian movie. 
I was so impressed. It's a beautiful film. And it's S O N T I, fantastic female driven movie, brilliant piece of work. And it's all Indian. So you might learn a bit about the Indian culture, but you don't already know. Well, that'd be nice because a lot of my classmates are Indian. Really good. Right. And Indian drama has really turned the corner. It's not lovely singing and dancing anymore. It's nitty gritty, hardcore drama. Brilliant. Hi. Hi, Annalise. Hi, I've got two of you there. Yes, I have my younger brother here who wanted nice to... to What's your name? Aaron. Nice to meet you, Aaron. Lovely to meet you both. Nice to meet you too. Where on earth are you? We're in Arizona. Um, oh, wow. In town or in, out of the desert? Where uh, we're living is pretty deserty, so lots of wild animals. I bet yeah, you don't go outside because it's like 120 degrees out there. Yeah, it's incredibly hot. Um, you're not exaggerating when it, it is like 120. <laughs> Where are you at in the span of your lifetime? I am a college student. I'm about to be a college senior, so I'm going back pretty soon uh, to start college for my last year. Yeah, next week. Okay, that's um, quick. It's a mash of hybrid and online learning for the year. They kind of told us uh, really recently, and it was a bit of a scramble, but uh, for the juniors and seniors returning, uh, they could no longer provide housing for us. They, they realized uh, last minute, I suppose, that it wasn't going to be safe enough. Uh, I think they thought they could accommodate everyone, you know, in single rooms and make sure people yeah. weren't coming into contact with people, but they realized they couldn't. Thankfully, I have a roommate and we were able to find uh, an apartment nearish the campus last minute. We both have honors thesis in labs that we're trying to do for this year to, um, as part of graduation, um, that we yeah. really wanted to be by campus for so that we could be in our labs and that kind of thing. Absolutely. I was wondering what all the practical people can do that need lab access, some sort of research access at least. You're not like an English student, you can just hang out and uh, read Shakespeare. I, I'm a biology major, so taking a few. That, yeah. What's your bro do? Where's he gone? He, oh, he's uh, checking with, I think, my mom really fast. <laughs> uh, but he's a high school student. He's about to be a senior as well. He's been just here for the summer. I've been lucky enough to be with my family for the summer. Right. Oh, that's, thank, thank goodness for that. And you've got an older brother too, or a, a middle brother? Yeah, an older brother as well. He's, he's quite a bit older. He's actually 30. <laughs> oh, that's like me and my brother. My brother's, I'm, I'm 16 years older than my brother. Okay, yeah, yeah. So similar situation. Similar vibe. You, are you going back to school too, bro? Are you, are you headed back any minute? Uh, yeah, in, on like September 7th, I think. Yeah, it's kind of a mixture as well, where they're, they're trying to do online for people who don't feel comfortable in person, um, and they're trying to limit the people who are on campus. That's great. That's, that's really great, because you hear stories that, you know, people aren't getting much choice, and oh, I know the teachers aren't getting much choice. What are you wanting to study, bro? I'm calling you bro because I've already forgotten your name. Uh, Aaron. Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be a senior in high school, and I, I've been kind of thinking like electrical engineering and like robotics sort of study for college. Both of you, impressive. I'm actually interested in going to medical school and I'm actually taking the MCAT this coming week. So it's been very stressful recently. Um, oh, goodness gracious. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about it now? You, you, you kind of on top of it? I think so. I've been taking practice tests and they've been going decently well. So I'm hoping that it'll be fine if I just keep a, you know, cool head going into yeah, it. Yeah, level head. Yeah. Good for you. I'm sure you'll do just fine. What do you do to have fun? What's your recommendation? I, I play violin. He does too, actually. <laughs> We're both oh, wow. We've got so many musical people yeah. here. <laughs> I'm doing a, a music uh, honors thesis too, because I'm a music minor at school as well um, for the coming year. And so I've been trying to get a head start on some of my pieces that'll be for kind of an hour long concert I do at the end of the year. Um, wow. So I've been working on some of those um, and uh, it's been really fun just to have that going in the background and, you know, take a break from, you know. Let's see if it's a kind of classical music that really balances. I think of it as like unraveling a tangled ball of spaghetti. You know, the, the brain is all tangled up and because you have to concentrate on all these different levels or the sort of different staves in the orchestral, orchestral, orchestral music, it just purifies everything for me and I just love that. Yeah, I personally really love doing chamber music the most when you get to play in a small group with other people. Yeah, and yeah. just, you know, there's like you're saying, there's so many layers and sometimes you look at it and you're like, how did this composer come up with this? This is, it fits together so seamlessly, but also it, it, there's all this crosstalk and yeah, for sure. Chamber music is particularly chatty, really is lovely to hear. Do you like the, the Beethoven, the late quartets? 
Yeah, yeah. I've played one quartet by Beethoven, number one, the Romanovsky. I've not played a lot of his quartets, but I would love to, you know, continue when I can eventually play with people again, <laughs> exploring more of his works. Um, you play with Aaron? Uh, yeah, sometimes we will play duets together. Um, my parents really love that. <laughs> so I bet they do. Aaron, what would you recommend someone who likes the violin to listen to? Oh. Just what you like. Don't worry about being correct for them. Okay. I would recommend a lot of Tchaikovsky, personally. <laughs> Specifically, the 1812 Overture is one of my favorites. Fantastic. Annelise, what, what do you like? I personally really like Shostakovich. He has a wonderful quartet that's pretty famous, at least for uh, classical musicians. It's called Shostakovich's uh, Quartet Number no. 8. It's really beautiful, very haunting. It was written while he was kind of being tormented by the Soviet Union back in the yeah. day, 1960s. There's chaos, but there's also really beautiful moments. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a bit more modern. It's 20th century, but he's a really great composer. I think Debussy is always really beautiful. as yeah. one of the pieces I'll be working on in my, my concert I'll be performing at the end of the year. Do you watch DS9? You like, have you watched Oh, yes, we both love DS9. We both yeah. love oh Our family is I'm huge. always amazed about how that intergenerational it is. It's so great oh, yeah. to hear. Yeah, my, my friends are always hearing me talk about Star Trek constantly. <laughs> so it's really <laughs> great to be able to find a club like this where everyone is so, you know, passionate about it. Well, I'm impressed by both of you if you don't find that patronizing. I just think you're both delightful, lovely, and uh, you're, and the fact that you're so multi-spectrum in terms of what you want to do in the world and uh, get kind of get it, and the artists, is fantastic. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. Thank you, Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Have a lovely weekend, everybody.